Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Christmas Eve service by candlelight. It's lovely to see people here, and we're glad to have uh, families with us. Just for your uh, information, there is a room just outside there down the first flight of stairs where uh, young kids can be looked after, and if at any time any of you want to pop in there uh, with the children, that's perfectly fine. There is a screen in there, and the service also will be uh, screened there for you. But our story this evening begins not on earth but in heaven, not with man, but with God, because, of course, the Christmas story is, first and foremost, God's story. Not the story of a distant God, a God who stays away, but the story of a God who has come near and in the person of Jesus Christ has become Emmanuel, God with us as the Savior, as the lover of his people. He came down from earth, uh, from heaven to earth, who was God and Lord of all.
go like this. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every living thing that breathes on the earth. So God created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created That's a wonderful picture, isn't it, of the world as it's meant to be, the world as God created it to be, and the world, of course, as we would love it to be. Perfect peace, harmony between male and female, between humankind and nature, between humankind and God. No wonder the next carol calls us to praise our Creator God, but notice when you come to the last line of the carol that it tells another story. We praise, yes, the God who made heaven and earth of naught, but also because with His own blood mankind He has bought. And after the next carol, the next reading will begin to explain to us why that must be so.
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. A curse upon human relationships, a curse upon nature, and a curse upon our very lives. To dust you shall return. And that is more like the world we actually know. And it's because our rebellion against God has put us in bondage. Through fear of death, people are subject to lifelong slavery. That's how the Bible puts it. But you heard God's promise there, even, even as the curse was pronounced, that evil would not have the last word, that God himself would intervene in history through the seed, the offspring of the woman, who would at last destroy the work of the devil and bring liberation to his people. And down through history, that promise shone all through long ages of darkness. Until at last, at the first Christmas, that promised offspring came. Came to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray.
the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonouring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. People often can dismiss the book of Genesis as just ancient history or even myth, but it isn't. St. Paul there in that reading expresses exactly the same picture, just in plainer words. And both simply describe the reality of a world that we know only too well. And in the Bible, you see, there is no sentimentality. But the Christian Christmas message is a message of real peace, peace descending from heaven. But of course, peace doesn't come to a world in rebellion without a very great cost, the cost of making peace. And the cost is to God himself, who alone could save us and bring that peace. And so, o'er this babe, still infant crying, shadows of the cross were lying, precious birth and costly dying. Sinners, greet your servant king. Thank you. 
There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. In that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord, with his hand and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. Your God will come and save you, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Those are words from Isaiah the prophet, speaking some 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, and promising the coming of God himself, coming to banish all darkness, all evil, and make that sorrow, that sighing, those tears flee away forever. God with us, God with power to save, God coming to reverse the curse of sin and to make his blessings flow as far as that curse had been found. And so Christmas is indeed a message of joy, joy to the world. if you noticed in that previous reading that the prophet said of this coming one that he would be a shoot from the stump of Jesse 
of King David's father. That is, he'd be a man. He'd be a descendant of King David. And yet he also calls him the root of Jesse because he is the root of all things. He himself is God the Lord who made all things, coming to save his people in the flesh of man. That's what the promise was all those centuries ago. That's what the birth of Jesus Christ fulfilled. The king of heaven, born into the squalor of a stable, come to rescue his people from the darkness of our human world, from the anguish of all our frail mortality. Listen to one last reading from the prophet Isaiah about the coming of that Savior King. People will look to the earth, he says, and behold, distress, darkness, the gloom of anguish. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has the light shined. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, the message of Christmas is of one who comes to those walking in darkness to bring a great light. Out of darkness we have light. And that's why on Christmas night all Christians sing. So before we think a little of what these words and the names of this one to come really mean, let's sing once more of the news of our merciful King's birth. Well, we're asking the question tonight and in all our carol services this year, who is he in yonder stall? The child born that first Christmas, which caused such extraordinary reactions uh, in the world at that time. Joy, 
for the faithful Israelites, Simeon and Anna and others who are waiting for the time to come, all from the Magi who came to seek him from the east, from the shepherds, even from the angels, and also great hatred from Herod the king, from many in the religious authorities. Why were there such expectations of this child in the manger? Well, the answer lies in these words of the prophets we've been hearing, who foretold his birth hundreds of years before. We've been looking at the words of Isaiah, spoken in around 734 B.C., and particularly at the extraordinary names that he says will signify what we need to know about who he would be and what he would do. Names uh, in the Bible are fraught with significance, much more so than, than I suppose our names tend to be today. Our, may, our names may have a meaning. We might be named after a family member or somebody. But often it's our nicknames, isn't it, that tell much more about who we are and what we're actually like. So King Edward I, well, that tells you something about that King of England. But uh, Edward Longshanks, the Hammer of the Scots, well, that tells you a bit more, doesn't it? It tells you he was a very tall man, and it tells you he was the scourge of this nation in the days of William Wallace and Robert the Bruce and so on. Likewise, your name might be John, but if your friends call you Fat Boy or something like that, then that probably tells you a little bit more, doesn't it? Or in Glasgow, it seems that most men go by one of two names. It's either big man or wee man. As in, all right, big man. That uh, common salutation that some of us uh, are used to receiving. You get the idea, you see. And Isaiah's names given to this child are like that. They tell us all about who and what he would be. And he tells us that the government would be upon his shoulder and his kingdom would know no end tells us that he would reign forever. And so he's going to be the Lord of all the world. An extraordinary claim, isn't it, for any mere mortal? Quite impossible. And then he says he'll be called the Wonderful Counselor. That is the one who counsels wonders, who purposes wonders for his people. That is, he will be the true leader of all mankind to lead them into the saving wonders of God. This morning we saw also that he'll be the true liberator of all the oppressed. He will be the mighty God. That is, he is God who comes to deliver his people with his own mighty hand out of the darkness of the shadow of death itself and into the light of everlasting life. That's why the prophet says the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, the light of his salvation. Well, there's two names left there, you can see, uh, that we're looking at tonight and tomorrow morning. And they tell us of the wonderful things that this child, born to be the king and the lord of all the world forever, what he would bring to those who would bow to him and rejoice in his lordship. He will bring wonderful love, and he'll bring perfect peace. Tonight, I want to think of the first of these. He'll be called, it says, the everlasting father. That is, he will be the true lover of all his children. Now, again, we have to understand the Bible's language properly. The word father in the Bible means perhaps a lot more than we might uh, at first realize. And by using this language of the everlasting father about this child, Isaiah is telling us that he is indicating his deity, that he is God, because that's language that's only used of God himself in the Bible. In Isaiah ch chapter 64, he says this, But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are the potter, and we are the work of your hand. You see, he's saying God is his people's father. He's their creator, just like a potter with the clay. In chapter 63, he says, You, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from of old is your name. You see, he's not only their Creator, but he's their Redeemer, he's their Savior. And notice, from of old. There's another famous reading we often have at Christmas from the prophet Micah. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, 
From you shall come forth one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is of old, from ancient days. There's a great consistency across the prophets in the Bible when you read them, you see. And to say that this child will be called the everlasting father is to say that he, a human being, born as a baby, would be the one who is called both the creator and the redeemer of all God's people. That's why the carols bid us come now with all to something that is beyond our comprehending. Love in its fullness lies in mortal span. Lo, within a manger lies he, he who built the starry skies. And see, that's what Isaiah means when he says he'll be called everlasting father. He is the one who is himself both the creator and the redeemer of his people. And the New Testament tells us plainly everywhere that that is what Jesus Christ was. Hebrews chapters 1 tells us that he is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of his nature. And he, Jesus Christ, upholds this universe by the word of his power. He is the creator. And it goes on, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's also the redeemer. He, this child, says St. Paul, is the image of the invisible God. And he will come, says Isaiah the prophet, to make known the wonderful fatherly love of God as creator and redeemer here on earth in our experience, in human flesh. That's why the apostle John, at the beginning of his gospel, says, no one has ever seen God, but the only begotten Son who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Made the Father known. And Jesus said, whoever has seen Me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. He, this child, the Christ child, the one who will be Emmanuel, God with us, He shall be called Everlasting Father. That's Christmas, according to Isaiah the prophet. And that explains the, the joy, the wonder, the awe of all those in the first Christmas story. So I want to think for a few minutes just what it means for this child to be truly fatherlike in that way to his people. Three things that the Bible itself points us to in our thinking. First of all, this child came to give his own children life. As a father gives life to his children, so he is called the everlasting father who gives everlasting life to those who are his. That remains a simple fact, doesn't it? You can't have the beginning of life without a father. Well, of course, our scientists are constantly dabbling in all sorts of things, quite controversial things these days, and talking about cloning and all that sort of thing. But Isaiah's not thinking about anything like that. He's just thinking about plain, normal life. And he's saying that God is a father who gives life. He creates just like a potter creates with his clay. Just like he fashions something beautiful out of something that was just a lump of clay, a lump of dust. And that's what this child was born to do, to bring life everlasting to bodies that are of themselves just, just dust, just like clay. And he comes to make something beautiful, something lasting, something useful and wonderful, something beloved and cherished by its maker. And in the coming of Jesus, you see, the New Testament tells us that God's purpose and grace from the beginning, from, from before all ages, has now been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death, says the Apostle. And brought life and immortality to light in the gospel. He comes to give his children life, everlasting life, from the everlasting Father. I came, says Jesus, that they might have life and have it in abundance. Not the dead religiosity of human religion. Now it is burdensome, that's, that's flavorless, that kills the soul. 
Maybe some of you have had experience of that. And it's put you off. That's not what Jesus is talking about. But life, life that conquers death, life that transcends death. Resurrection life. I am the resurrection and the life, said Jesus. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live, live forever. This child came to give his children life everlasting. He is the everlasting father who begets everlasting life. And there's no greater assurance, no greater comfort than to know that, especially as you get older and as your body begins to feel more and more like dust and clay. But secondly, this child comes to give his children love as a father gives love to his children and provides for them and protects them. So he comes to give eternally father-like love and protection and provision for his children. Now, of course, we have to say, don't we, that sadly not all fathers do love and protect and provide for their children. And we live in a culture where the absent father is increasingly common. And so many of us may have quite mixed feelings about fathers. Even though, of course, some, some absent fathers for sure do love their children dearly, would love and long to be with them much, much more than they are, of course. But there are many people, aren't there, who've known great pain, great disappointment in their fathers. Not the love, not the provision, not the protection that I'm speaking about. But you see, the very fact of that disappointment in itself, and even that anger, it tells, doesn't it, that we know. We know what a father's love should be. We know what real fatherhood does speak of. And the Bible portrays God as an infinitely loving father. The prophet Jeremiah, another of the prophets, speaks of the Lord in these fatherly terms as one who, who lavishes love, even, even on his wayward children. He says, I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they will not stumble because I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. I will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. He gives his children love. He cares for his lambs like a shepherd. And Isaiah uses exactly that same language of the father's shepherd-like love. Be behold, he says, he comes with might and his strong arm rules for him. Yes, he's a figure of authority, as any good father must be to his children if they're not to be ruined. Authority, but also great tenderness. He will tend his flock like a shepherd, a strong protector, a leader. But also he will, he will gather his lambs in his arms. He'll carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead those that are with young. And when this child finally came as a man, Jesus said himself, I am the good shepherd. The one who loves his sheep so dearly that he lays down his own life for his sheep that they might come to him, that they might be protected by him forever and ever. He, he gives his children everlasting love to protect, to provide, to lead them, to cherish them as his own. I remember once watching a rather sentimental Hollywood film. Didn't really enjoy the film, but I remember one line that I've never forgotten from it, and it's a father speaking to his as yet unborn child. And he said this, I will be a father to you from the day you are born until the day I die. And that's true of the Lord Jesus Christ to us, to his people, except that he will never die because having been raised from the dead, he will never ever die again. He's the everlasting father. And that means that you can bank on his love and on his care and on his provision forever and ever and ever if you're his child. He will always stay with you through all the dilemmas that you face in life, through all the struggles that you'll encounter. He will always provide for your needs so that you don't have to live in anxiety and fear. 
Not necessarily for all your wants, but like a good father for what you need, not what you want. That's why Jesus said, don't be anxious about clothes or food or all of these things, for your heavenly father knows that you have need of these. And even when it seems as though he's being harsh with us, we know that it's those he loves as his children that he disciplines. Because he does love with real father-like love. And you know that like a father who cares for his children, he also is interceding in prayer at the throne of grace for his own. Hebrews chapter 7 tells us that he always lives to make intercession for them because he's the everlasting father. And his prayers, his intercessions never ever go unheard at that great throne of grace in heaven. He comes as a father to give life and to give love. And third, this child who comes, comes to give his children a legacy. As a good father gives a legacy to his children, a home and a family and an inheritance, so he is called the everlasting father who gives an everlasting home and an everlasting family and an everlasting inheritance to his children. And once again, that's a wonderful thing. If you have a father like that, if you have a home of means and of substance and a family of real love, and many don't. Many fathers leave a lot to be desired, don't they, as we know. Many even leave their children or orphaned. But the wonderful message of the Scriptures is that in this child comes one who will be the everlasting father to extend his legacy even to those who have never, ever known that earthly fatherhood, who have never known the joys of home, of family, and all that that brings to them. Listen to how the psalmist, the singer of the Bible, describes the God of the Bible. Father of the fatherless, protector of widows is God in his habitation. God sets the lonely in families. He sets the solitary in a home. You see, he's an adoptive father. He's one who reaches out to draw into his own family and under his own protection and care all of those who were, who were otherwise outcasts, who were otherwise strangers and lonely and lost and solitary and alone with no father, with no family, but he comes to draw them in. It's such a feature, isn't it, of our world today? A loneless, solitary people living solitary lives, lost and lonely in the midst of a, a noisy, bustling, busy world. You see, all that and more is, is just a symptom of the far greater lostness that the Bible talks about as the real problem of our human condition. It's the problem of sin. It's the problem of rebellion in our hearts against God our Father, our Creator, our Lord. That, that is what has made us to be cast adrift like this. That's what caused us to be cast out of our true home, to be cast out of the family of God from the place where God himself dwells, the garden of God. That's the imagery there, barred by those angels with their flaming swords because of our refusal to live in obedience to God our Heavenly Father. But in this child, in the birth and the coming of Jesus Christ comes one who makes us again his children. He comes to be a father, to give us again that true legacy, that true love, that true life, the home, the family, everything that we'd lost forever. In the fullness of the time, says St. Paul, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So be heirs through God. We've received, he says, the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. That's what Jesus Christ accomplished by bearing away our sins on his body on the cross, says Peter. We who were once straying like lost sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd 
to the overseer of our souls. As a loving Father, He has moved heaven and earth to come and to bring us home, to a real home, to a real family, to a real inheritance forever and ever. That's why Jesus said to His disciples just before He went to the cross, in my Father's house are many rooms and I'm going. I'm going to prepare a place for you who believe in me. And he did that through his death. The good shepherd laying down his life for the sheep that they might at last come home and and have the legacy that he had won for them. He came to bring a father's love, an everlasting life and love and legacy. And that is what belongs to all who know him as the everlasting father, as the true lover of all his children. So let me ask you tonight, this Christmas Eve, is he that father to you? Are you in his family? Do you belong to him? His door is an open door. Jesus said that. I am the door, said Jesus. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Clear as day. And yet it is still possible, isn't it, to refuse to have anything to do with his family. That was so in Jesus' day. It's still the same today. You refuse to come to me that you might have life, is what Jesus said to his hearers. He said that to some very religious people, to some very particular church-going people. You, you refuse to come to me to have life. And when he said, I am the good shepherd who loves and cares and, and provides for all his own, there were some who refused and said, he's, a, he's got a demon. We want nothing to do with him. This is all nonsense. Friends, his is a glorious legacy of everlasting love, of everlasting life. But that legacy can't be for those who insist on writing themselves out of the will by scorning Jesus Christ and his offer of life. But listen, this Christmas Eve, even now, the door is open. Even for those who have, who have scorned him all their life long, who have spat on him, who have rejected him, who have called him demonic and wanted nothing to do with him. Still, he is willing to be an everlasting father. Perhaps the best known of all Jesus' stories is that wonderful parable he tells in Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal son. In many ways, it would be much better called the the parable of the waiting father because the father is waiting and watching and longing for the return of his lost son. And at the first sign of his returning son, he is off. And Jesus says he felt compassion and he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And even as he's trying to get the words out and confessing his sin to his father, his father is is clothing him and putting a ring on his finger and a great robe on him and preparing a great feast, a great celebration of joy at his return. A return to new life and to his true family and legacy, and to his Father's house of love, and to the joy of all the angels in heaven, says Jesus. Friends, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what Christmas is all about. In Jesus Christ, the wonderful fatherly love of God is revealed to rebellious human children forever. He came to be the everlasting Father, to bring home those who are lost. Don't write yourself out of his life and his love and his legacy this Christmas. Why would anyone, why would anyone ever want to do such a thing? Amen. Well, we're going to sing as we close our carols this evening. The last carol that speaks of where this story begins in councils of eternity, in the Father's heart of love, 
who declares that he will be an everlasting father to bring home children forever. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, there came one to earth who was the image of your invisible greatness, who showed us the true radiance of your glory, so that we could hear the beauty of your words and know the love of your deep heart. And so we pray that you might open all of our eyes and open all of our hearts to the light that shines in the darkness in our great Savior, that we may know him and love him, and in doing so find a Father's life and love and legacy to be ours, not only this Christmas, but forever and ever. 
And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.